Uh, good afternoon, good afternoon, everyone. I am um, really happy and honored to be here yeah, for multiple, multiple reasons. reasons. First, first of all, the first, the first time, time I ever went, went abroad, abroad in my life, in my life is the time, time when I was a math student, student in Russia, in, in, in Moscow, Moscow. And, and I went, I went to a summer school in, in Finland, Finland, which was, was in Ubasco. A small, a small town, town to the north one here. Yeah. Yeah. And, I and I think there was, there was a, time a time actually when, when I, decided I decided that science was something that, that I wanted to be doing. Be doing. And, and uh, uh, hence it's quite exciting, exciting to be standing, standing here, here in front of you a bit, on, on, on the other side, side of the front row. So today, so today this talk is uh, fairly short, it's just, just one hour. hour. You already you heard today about the box and, and the priors, priors and, and a lot of concepts, concepts which we're going, going to reiterate, reiterate over. And, and uh, uh, this, this lecture, lecture does not have practicals, however, 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 I would like to show you the next, next slide. slide. I'm not I'm sure it's working. <laughs> It, it just buzzed. Worked earlier today when I tried. <laughs> okay, I yeah, think I, I can, can do it by hand. By hand. No, problem. no problem. So, so if, if at, at some, some point, point um, you would like, like to go, go through, through the examples which I'm, which I'm going, going to show you today, today by hand, by hand. Then you can, you can find this directory on GitHub. GitHub. That's, That's my name and surname, surname in one, one word, word, and then and probably I2022. I'm happy, I'm happy to, share to share the link, the link on Slack later, later as well. As well. And uh, the, the prerequisites, prerequisites um, just, to just to listen to, listen to the store, store obviously, obviously nothing, nothing but if, you if you would like to, like to perform uh, all, uh, all the, <coughs> all the all iterations, iterations of uh, the modeling, modeling, then, then you, would you need would need to know, know R and Stan as, as a probabilistic, probabilistic programming language, language because, because both, both models, models that, that I'm going, going to talk, talk about are formalized, formalized Stan. That's, That's the, the overview, overview of what we're going to uh, talk about, about today, today uh, an, overview an overview of Bayesian inference, which we've already, already repeated today about, about three or four times. times. Then general, general principles, principles of Bayesian, Bayesian workflow, we would, we would answer, answer such a question. question. What, is what is it? it? Why, why do we need to do it? And uh, what, uh, what does it consist of? Consist and we'll consider and we'll two consider examples two and draw some conclusions, some conclusions to answer. So what? So what? Bayesian inference. <clears throat> is, is a way, a way of, of inferring, inferring another, another way, way of saying finding, finding a posterior distribution, distribution of an unknown an parameter, parameter. Yeah, we call yeah, it meter, given, given some, some data, data y. y. And the, and the components that allow, that allow us to do, do so are the likelihood, likelihood which, which normally captures the data generating, generating process, and, and the prior. The prior, prior, prior can, can be either, either our prior belief, belief or guess. guess or information, information that, that we gather from pre-existing work, work or literature. Or literature. <laughs> Looks, Looks pretty, pretty simple, simple, so what, what can possibly go, go wrong, wrong, right? right? And, and a, a lot, lot of things, things to, to our big surprise. Big surprise. Um, um, this, this is just, just uh, <coughs> putting, putting a bit of a bit examples, examples uh, behind, behind the, the formula. formula. Uh, on, uh, on the previous, previous slide. slide. So consider, so consider we, have we have some, some uh, observation, observation y, y, and we, and we assume, assume they are all distributed, distributed normally, normally, and they, and are, they independent are independent from each other. other. In that, that case, case, we can, we can form, form our likelihood, likelihood which, which is, is the product, product of, of individual, individual normals. normals. And, and in, in uh, those normals, normals so we, assume we assume the variance is given, and is equal to 1. And the mean is a parameter. To, to this parameter, we, we give the prior. prior. Uh, this, is uh, this is very similar, similar to one of the examples, examples we, just we just saw in, in uh, formulated, formulated in, in Pyro. Pyro. So, so our, our task, task is then given, given the likelihood, given, given the prior, prior, to derive a posterior, posterior distribution, distribution of theta. theta. And in, and in some, some cases, cases, I think, I think like in a lecture this morning, we saw in case of certain distributions, it is possible to do that analytically, but in but real life, real life when, we when we work with really, really complex, complex data, data, complex data, data generating, generating processes, processes and <coughs> really noisy, noisy and not, not well behaved data or distributions, this is not possible. So in, in practice, it occurs, occurs rarely that we're so lucky to be able to use closed form uh, for, for the series. series. 
This is again, and you, you already heard a lot about, about linguistic, linguistic programming, programming languages, languages today. today. And, and to recap, recap, what, what do, do they allow us to do? What is the main uh, capability? They allow us, us to focus on modeling. On modeling. So, every so every time we want to perform Bayesian, Bayesian inference, we do not we do need, need to write, write our sample from, from scratch. scratch. And, and uh, from, from user's, user's perspective, perspective, we need, need to define, define prior and likelihood. So I noticed, so I noticed that this school is heavily, heavily variational inference based, based, based already, already on what uh, I heard today, but also, also looking, looking through, through the slides, the slides of, of previous school. school. And, and this, this is just a disclaimer, disclaimer. I, come I come rather from, from MCMC, MCMC culture. culture. So, so of, of course, course most, most of the material, of the material is translatable. Material. Just to bear in mind, a lot of models I'm talking about, they understand behind themselves MCMC inference. So, and uh, the last point, why do we want to use PPLs is because they already have as a part of the software, various diagnostic tools, which can help us assess whether inference went well or something went wrong. What are those uh, diagnostic tools? For example, after we have performed uh, MCMC inference, we need to compare where each of the chain has converged and how do various chains uh, compare to each other. And uh, to help us do that numerically, uh, such statistics as R hat exist. I think it's also called Gelman Rubin. Roughly what it uh, estimates is uh, variance within chain to variance between chain. Also, visually, we can expect uh, inspect convergence by looking at trace plots. We'll see a lot of examples later on if it does not make sense at this point. So trace plot is a plot of the estimate of each parameter at every iteration. So it makes this um, zigzag shape. And we always want to assess a trace plot for stationarity. Stationarity means if we chop this plot into several pieces and change the numbering of pieces, for example, if the whole chain consisted out of sections one, two, three, and we interchange section three and one, get three, two, one, the chain visually should still look the same. Then effective sample size is another important quantity for us to look at. The MCMC samples normally would be out or correlated. So they're not, uh, each sample is not exactly independent from the previous sample. And effective sample, sample size is the estimate of how many independent draws we would need to get the same level of variation in the chain as we got given the dependent samples. Here's an example of a trace plot of four chains. So we had a parameter theta in that initial model where theta was unknown. We use the data to assess it. You can notice that part of, uh, the, of, uh, of the trace plot is shaded and that's the part we're not interested in. So whatever happened there, it was a warm up. It was uh, MCMC just uh, building up some uh, strength before it actually runs the final inference for, for us. So if we wanted to make predictions or use uh, the samples for some kind of decision-making, we would use this second part in the unshaded area. And what we always want to see by looking at those chains is, as you can see, all of the four chains roughly explore the same area. So visually they overlap and uh, each chain does not wander very far out in none of the directions. So they all fluctuate around roughly the same value. This is an example of a trace plot which we would not like to use for further um, down, down, downstream decision making. Why? Because it, A, chains do not agree with, with um, each other very well, but also none of the chains look stationary. Previously, we were overlaying trace plots, um, but equally we can overlay posterior distributions obtained by four chains. So if you allow each of the chain vote, they all vote in this situation for the same range of values, which is again the behavior which we would like to see. So what is 
Bayesian workflow and why do we need it? First of all, speaking about workflow more general, we hear this word all around um, these days, not just even in software, but obviously in software and machine learning. I copied this image from um, Google, one of the Google's website where they talk about ML ops. So probably you heard a lot, um, a lot already about it. <clears throat> this is a standard of running generally a machine learning lifecycle, starting from data preparation, following up with model building, and then putting your model to production. In the 60s, uh, statistician Box has uh, introduced a loop um, which he suggested to use uh, to understand the scientific method. Later on, David Bly has written a paper discussing, again, the cycle of estimating latent variables using the data, and he has called it the boxes loop. Um, in the modern days and in the Bayesian um, world, so in the Bayesian modern days, we talk a lot about Bayesian workflow. And uh, Andrew Gelman and Archivectory, obviously located um, very close to here, have uh, tried to summarize what in modern Bayesian statistics are the possible steps of the life cycle of a Bayesian model. As, as you can see, it can barely fit onto one slide. It does fit, but uh, letters are nearly indistinguishable. It means that the life cycle of a Bayesian model can become quite complicated. And um, there are some features which the Bayesian workflow shares with a normal machine learning workflow, but there are some features which also distinguish it. Why? Well, because it's Bayesian and we have priors and posteriors. These are the concepts that classical frequentist uh, machine learning statistics models would not have. Also, you notice that uh, you can go in loops in various ways on this graph. Um, as I mentioned, so one of, one of the features that distinguishes it, it is prior and posterior predictive checking. So prior predictive checking is useful, first of all, to visualize priors but also in complex models, for example, when you pose priors on the quantities which do not have direct um, interpretation or vice versa, where you have direct interpretation of certain quantities, but they get transformed in nonlinear ways with a new model. For example, if your model is um, an ordinary differential equation and um, if we use the priors only without using the data and run the model forward using its generative properties and then overlay it with the actual data which we have at hand, we can assess whether the given model is adequate with respect to the data. And I want to underline, we are dr we're just overlaying the data with the prior predictions, but we're not using the data for the model. So it is manual in a sense that you still need to write down your model, but then you can specify uh, in, in your program whether you want likelihood to be assessed or you just want all the quantities to be simulated forward. Here's just one example of how a Bayesian workflow can look like. Uh, the first step is always to understand the domain, uh, be it physics, biology, pharmaceutical, and so on. What is the question we want to answer? The second step is to create a mathematical formalization, then write up the code, test it, debug, then perform prior predictive checks to assess whether the priors that we have chosen are fit for the data or they produce adequate predictions at all fit the model, assess the convergence, uh, whether the fit uh, is 
satisfying than using the posterior predictive in the same manner as we use the prior predictive, perform prior predictive check. And then if uh, even given all that went smoothly, still sometimes we have a need to improve the model. Here come uh, two examples. The first example is from the field of epidemiology, where we would like to model transmission of a disease. And there exists a multitude of models to do that. They can be classified by scale, for example, so they can be population-based or agent-based. Agent-based is when we try to model each individual of the population and create stochastic events of what happens to each individual and then create summaries from there. A population-based model is rather when we divide the whole population into groups and we model the volume of each group. Again, the... <clears throat> All the transitions might be considered deterministic or stochastic, and certainly for each disease, we would need to make specific choices about mechanism, such as incubation, contagion, vaccination, mobility. If I was speaking about it three years ago, uh, I think all of this would sound quite surprising to all of you, um, but I think by now, none of this needs explanation. So when our choice falls onto a mechanistic model, which is population-based and deterministic, a common route to perform such modeling is by using ordinary differential equations or so-called compartment models. We divide the whole population into homogeneous groups, and then we define flows from one group to another, and then we need to estimate the volume of each group at every time point. As any ODE, it needs some initial condition. And given this condition, we can solve the ODE, obtaining a function which is time dependent for each of the compartments. One of the simplest model that exists in this area is the so-called SIR model. The compartments here are susceptible, infectious, and recovered, and uh, this, such a system is governed by two constant parameters, beta and gamma. So beta governs how fast people get infected, and gamma describes how quickly people get recovered. Each of the functions S, I, and R are time-dependent, and we make an assumption of constant population. So in sum, they all produce one number N, which does not change over time and also beta and gamma are um, constant. We can simulate um, either ideally using the priors, but even if we don't, uh, if the model is very simple, we can just form, uh, simulate forward in our language of choice given some initial datum. So you can see here a realization of uh, such an ODI where we can get three trajectories. And normally what we, the data that we get is the data on the I compartment, the infected. And we can inform this compartment either in the form of prevalence data or incidence data. So incidence data is how many people got infected every day, new infections also called, or uh, when we model prevalence um, at, a, at each point in time where it says how many people are diseased today. And here's an example data set um, collected in 1978 at a British boarding school where 763 male students uh, lived, uh, nearly all of them permanently. There was an influenza outbreak. It started with one boy and uh, 512 students in the course of this disease became infected. You can see the graph of the data, which is now prevalent. So on every day, we know the count of diseased boys in the boarding school. We specify our model. We know the initial values for S, I, and R. We choose a likelihood. So because we're dealing with count data, we need to choose among count distributions. So the typical choices would be Poisson or negative binomial. And... Um, 
we need to understand what are the parame unknown parameters to be estimated in this model. Here, the uh, beta and gamma, which describe the ODE, and phi as a parameter describing the over dispersion of the negative distribution. Once we have identified the parameters, we're giving them certain priors. We perform the prior predictive check. Um, again, reminding that data has not been used at this point. Using the prize which we chose, we run the ODE forward. We obtain some trajectories, so possible solutions of this ODE. We plot them either as individual tra trajectories or ideally we calculate a bound of possible um, uh, a range of possible trajectories and overlay with, with data. We can see that data lies within what is possible under this model, so we can go ahead and fit the model. Again, what happens in the gray shaded area, we are not uh, particularly concerned about, but what happens in the white area looks quite satisfactory. There are several chains, they overlap and look more or less stationary, good for us at this point. And another checking is overlaying the posterior distributions again. And we see for all parameters, they agree quite well. So what have we done? We started with some data, we described a model which had likelihood and priors. We used the data. Now what we have at hand is posterior predictive. Now using the posterior predictive distribution and the generative model, we again create trajectories. Now without using the data because the data is implicitly already part of this generation. And again, we overlay the data with the posterior predictions and uh, the graph looks quite satisfactory. So we were able to estimate each of the parameters and obtain a posterior distribution for it. So we can go ahead to our downstream tasks and perform decision-making. Great. So we think now we know how to model diseases. Yes, exactly. So once you fall, uh, the SIR model has a lot of assumptions behind it, which are not very realistic, or they are very real. They are realistic, or only in a very closed-up population. Yeah. So it does not include uh, what you're talking about is births and deaths, for example, or uh, immunity. So if uh, what you asked basically was immunity, if they end up in recovered compartment, spend a certain amount of time, and then at a certain rate, again, become susceptible. Yeah, that would be a different, more complex model. Uh, leading us to another example. Oh, sure. Yes, uh, you do run MCMC where your likelihood is pointing at this I compartment, the infected, so number of infected people. And that is exactly the data that you have for. And the other two compartments are latent. You don't have any data. You need to infer what's happening in those two compartments. So yeah, now we know how to model diseases. And here we take very recent data from COVID from Switzerland uh, from 2020, and we apply the same SIR model to it. And guess what? It does not work very well. What do we see? First of all, the bottom line shows how our predictions correspond to the data and they don't correspond very well. And the top row shows that some chains are exploring completely different spaces um, as compared to the other chains. What we are trying to do then, uh, we try to think what parts of the domain knowledge have we missed? So there's a big difference uh, between a boarding school in England where every single boy is observed and once he gets uh, infected, the data gets recorded. So the data is quite precise. While in 2020, when COVID just started, no one was paying as much attention, at least at the start, 
at uh, recording and capturing of those um, cases, there might be a lot of underreporting. So we're introducing here a reporting factor. So to those observed cases, we just multiply them by a new parameter, and this new parameter also is assessed by the model. And even then, we can see that the data and posterior do not align very well. Another feature we realized we have missed is uh, accounting for their incubation time. Some diseases, once you get infected, uh, symptoms arrive quite soon, which is not the case for COVID, as we know, because it takes time from infection. And we introduce a new compartment, the exposed compartment, and we assign some prior to a new parameter, A. A is the rate of becoming infectious once you have been exposed. We run this model, model forward, and we see that the fits have improved, the bottom line, even though not for all chains. But again, we see that there is always one or two chains separating themselves from the rest. So again, they're exploring very different uh, spaces. Then we went and looked up in the literature, what is actually this um, time between being exposed. And it turned out that already there has been a lot of literature saying it's between five and six days. That's why we can go and adjust the prior. And every time I say it, this means going back to the start, running prior predictive, seeing if prior predictive is still okay. But that is exactly what we didn't do. That's why we had to go in all these circles. And the final step was modeling for control measures, because as you can realize, a disease in the wild, uh, which is running completely unmitigated, will look very different from a disease where control measures have been introduced. So we have turned the forcing function from being constant into being time dependent. And even that step did not help us entirely. So the ultimate solution was to go and find some additional data, which was public, because the Canton of Geneva of Switzerland has published um, their serological survey data, which basically tells us about the immunity of people in Canton of Geneva between May 4th and May 7th. Then we again made a major assumption that immunity of people in Geneva has the same shape as immunity of people over the whole Switzerland. And then we use this additional data to inform the R compartment, the recovered. And only after that, the fits looked satisfactory. So the actual fit you can see is on the plot A. And um, graph C, for example, characterizes the function that we used for the lockdown. There was one example case study, um, which you can follow in every single detail, exists online, and there is a corresponding paper, and the links are in the GitHub. Here's a second example, um, quite different nature of the model. It comes from the pharmaceutical industry. There, we need to fit concentration response curves, which up till some recent time wasn't actually an issue because most of the drugs that we can currently buy in the pharmacy are the so-called small molecules. And um, recently, due to the progress in pharmaceutical sciences and in chemistry as well, some compounds begin to appear which are not small molecules anymore and they do not depend as small molecules. So for small molecules, we knew that concentration response curves always had this sigmoidal or S, uh, so they had the S shape or sigmoidal shape, which means they start with the plateau, then they show some activity, and then they plateau again. And I have not explained what a concentration response curve is. So once we come up with potential candidates against a certain disease, we want to rank all of them. So we take each of the compounds and we test them in the lab in vitro, so in certain liquid, which is reminiscent of what is happening in the body. And then we increase the dose and uh, we collect the data on what is this compound do, um, doing with a response to external, uh, external stimuli at every single dose. So this new drug modality, which is called Protex, 
shows very interesting behavior. There is also a mechanistic study of what it should do. And what it should do, it should start with a plateau, then it should um, start showing some activity, and then it should return back to the same level of the plateau where it started. However, when scientists experimentally began to measure this data, this beha exact behavior was not observed. Here's an example of the data that they get. So on the x-axis, you see the log uh, scale of the concentration, so how much drug we're putting in a dish. And on the y-axis, we see the amount of response. Also, the amount of response comes in uh, two flavors, the orange and the blue one. They are just replicates. So the same experiment is being run twice with the same concentration. The gray dots uh, in the shape of stars are controls. So they are also being put in a dish, but there was no compound there at all. And um, we go to the scientists, we talk to them and ask, what is the, your understanding of the problem? And what do you think is a must in this curve that we need to make? And they say, well, at low concentration, nearly any single compound should show a plateau because when concentration is very low, it should be doing nothing. Then we should allow it to show the actual activity that is happening in the dish and that at higher concentrations, we should allow it fluctuate as the data shows. And that is called the hook effect. So a traditional model that has been used for probably more than 100 years by now, is the uh, classical Hills model or the four parameters model. Also, based on the data I have shown you, there is several um, sources of uncertainty, such as every curve we will fit will not be sure about it. There is a curve uncertainty, as well as replicate to replicate variation. So these uh, sources of uncertainty inform our likelihood. But right now we will focus specifically on what is the model for that mean curve. That is the traditional model that normally without knowing anything about the compound, any scientists would uh, want uh, to be fitted. And um, it is driven by four parameters. The one um, is where so degradation at zero concentration, the starting point, then it's characterized by certain characteristics at half degradation point. One of them is the hill slope. Basically, it tells you how fast the um, compound is showing the activity. We fit that model to the data. Trace plots look great, and so do posterior distributions. So we think we have solved the problem. And then we'll look at the posterior predictive and generally at our fit. So this is the fit, this is the data. At the left, as the scientists wanted, there is a plateau at higher concentrations. However, the data and the fit do not correspond to each other well. So what to do? We decide to use a more flexible model and um, Having spoken to the scientists, there is no other parametric model they know that was tested in the field. So we just go by with what we know about flexible um, curve, curve feeding. I know you have a whole lecture on Gaussian processes in a couple of days, but just summarizing it all in one slide. This is a group of models that allows us to fit flexible curves. And the prior, uh, which we need to use for it, has zero mean and a certain kernel. This kernel allows us to define the covariance matrix. So all you need to understand, if you haven't seen this before, is the expression for Kij. So if Xi and Xj are the two concentrations, then we can model the dependence between them or the correlation between them using this model. We fit this model to the data. And again, we look at the, all the diagnostics. The diagnostics look fine, and trace plots look stationary, and chains seem to be mixing, agreeing. Again, uh, overlaying the distributions, the posteriors of different chains seem to agree with each other. So we'll look now at higher concentrations. Again, now the curve is capturing the hook effect. What happened to the low concentrations, though, 
So the scientists know that at low concentrations, there needs to be a plateau, but also at the low concentrations, um, they were sure there is more sensitivity to the measurement. So to account for this, we again need to adjust our model somehow that at the start, it is a plateau, but then at high concentrations, it is flexible. And what do we do? Um, Gaussian processes allow us to perform kernel design, which means that if we start with two separate different GPs, one we call F1 with kernel K1, second is F2 with kernel K2, then we can compose a new um, Gaussian process, which we called F theta, because it's governed by parameter theta. Theta is this inflection point, which in the old sense we would uh, call the half degradation. So imagine where, where the slope begins to happen and where the drop is the most dramatic of the curve. That will be our theta, the change point. And um, we introduce this parameter G, which tells us how fast a function f theta from f1 is transitioning to become F2. So we have these weights 1 minus W and W, which means that at every point X, F theta is a linear combination of F1 and F2. And those coefficients, always between 0 and 1, define how much at each X it is more like F1 or like F2. This is a very new model to us. And um, this parameter G, which defines the um, slopiness of the transition function. So this is, uh, W is a sigmoidal function, but is it a standard sigmoid or is it more of a um, slopey sigmoid or really very shallow sigmoid? We need to experiment. We have never seen this um, kernel before. So what we do, we're running prior predictives. We don't even overlay it with data. We just want to understand how does parameter G impact the shapes that we are getting. So here at very low concentrations, we do get a plateau, but then at higher concentrations, while we're getting a flexibility, this transition is very drastic. It might be un really unrealistic for the system that we work in. On the contrary, when the parameter G equals to one, there is a lot of flexibility at higher concentra concentration. However, at lower concentrations, there is not much of a plateau. So we settle with a value where G equals 10. A remark is that G, as you probably have thought already about, could be just a parameter in the model. And um, if it was a simple model, adding just a new parameter would not be a big deal. But since a, um, this uh, model might have a lot of uh, data coming into it, as well as Gaussian process is already not the fastest model to run, we could either set an informative prior centered at the value G10 or just um, set it to begin with, for example, uh, for, for um, yeah, just to begin with at a set value. And then at a later stage, if we want to relax uh, G, we can give it a prior. So we have chosen G equals to 10. And now uh, we are, I'm skipping the steps where the fit looks great. It, did look great even when we didn't like the model. So here it looked, um, they looked fine again. What we do observe, a plateau on the left and a lot of flexibility at high concentrations. What conclusions have we drawn? So Bayesian workflow generally is an iterative process of model building and there is no one shoe fits all. So there is no one linear path of building a perfect Bayesian model. Every now and then there are loops that we need to make and turns that we need to make. So already in these two examples, we saw a whole lot of various issues, starting with domain understanding, for example, in the curve fitting, we would never be able to understand ourselves what are the appropriate curve shapes at all. 
then also using the domain knowledge, such as in the first example, we informed the recovery time or the um, time of um, developing symptom symptoms based on what we found in the literature. Also, in one of the examples, we used external data to point at a latent variable, which prior to that was not informed by anything. And just developing more complex models. I've listed this item as last because this property is inherent to a lot of machine learning and statistics workflows. We naturally tend to think about, oh, what's the best model I could develop here? So in the Bayesian work workflow, we need to pay a lot of attention to convergence, prior predictive check, posterior predictive check. These are uh, the references that this talk majorly has been um, based on, but of course you can imagine there's a lot of liter literature generally around each of the item in that box. So there's literature on cross-validation in the Bayesian context, or there is literature on visualization, on prior predictive checks, on posterior predictive checks, and so on. So, I could not go into details or we could not run any hands-on examples. As said, hands-on material does exist in line. Maybe in the coming years, um, I can come back or some colleagues can come back and run an extended um, tutorial for examples like one of those. Um, for now, please just stay in touch and send any questions, comments to email and um, Twitter. Also, can I make an announcement? Yeah, there is a, an announcement. So, <laughs> hopefully, some of you found the stories from epidemiology, uh, global health generally, and pharmaceutical industry uh, industry interesting. And right now, the group where I work, and it's not actually a group, uh, we're just a network. This network does not exist on paper, but there is a couple of principal investigators and we're spread all over UK, we're in London, in Oxford, uh, some people are in Copenhagen, someone is moving to Singapore soon. So there's a couple of open positions. Some of them are already advertised, some are on the way. You can either reach out to me for more details or email to Sat and Sam. Also, we've just created for this school, so people had somewhere to email. The last row on the slide is now the email of the network. And positions are open both for postdocs at Oxford as well as whole range from PhD students to assistant professors in Copenhagen as well as something in London. But if you're generally interested in these topics, reach out maybe for a longer conversation. <laughs>